All right, y'all, you're locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and the final training camp practice is now in the books and now we're all about patience on not only when the season starts but also the timeline for when Desmond Ritter might take over as the Falcon starter. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. your very humble host of this Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports podcast family. And we thank you guys every day for checking out Locked On Falcons, which is free and available Monday through Friday on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and of course, on youtube make sure you subscribe to lockdown falcons on youtube hit that bell give us a like and you will get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops so today we are talking about the final day of joint practices with the jacksonville jaguars basically the final day of training camp uh, because after the preseason game on saturday against the jaguars uh, the falcons will sort of get into their normal practice schedule for the regular season and then obviously there's going to be uh, a week or two uh before you know the regular season kicks off um so training camp is pretty much a wrap um and you know the big question surrounding the falcons at least if you check out national headlines is you know when why aren't the falcons starting desmond ritter should the falcons start desmond ritter we'll get to that later again i know some of you guys don't want to hear that stuff so we'll start off today talking about, uh, you know, one of the standouts in today's practice against the Jaguars and D. Alford. And, um, you know, he had two interceptions on the day. Uh, and, you know, D. Alford has been, at least according to various people, one of the outstanding players for the Falcons this training camp. Mike Rothstein in his final notes of training camp uh, from uh, today's joint practices basically named him the MVP of training camp. Uh, and I think that's led to a lot of people having expectations that D. Alford has carved out a, a, a significant role with this team. And that's certainly a possibility, although I expressed on yesterday's episode that I, I still think he probably is not going to have as significant a role as maybe some people would believe. I think a lot of people are kind of expecting him to potentially push uh, not only to be, you know, the the cornerback four, uh, but potentially could push as the cornerback three. Um, and, you know, I don't think that's likely to happen. And the main reason, as I explained on yesterday, is because uh, the Falcons will probably only have five active cornerbacks on game day. And I don't currently expect Alfred to be one of those. I think those five will be the starters in AJ Terrell, Casey Hayward, Isaiah Oliver, and Mike Ford and Darren Hall being the two backups. Uh, and part of the reason I believe that is um, because, um, you know, we saw yesterday Hall getting some work with the first team. We've seen Alfred get some work with the first team at the nickel, uh, but I think that's mostly because the Falcons are having him and Mike Ford compete to be the primary backup behind Isaiah Oliver. And while Isaiah Oliver has been getting the brunt of his work with the twos and threes, I don't think, as Mike Rothstein explained on an episode last week, I don't think that's because the Falcons are down on Oliver. They're just basically trying to get him back up to speed for the regular season. He's basically on his own practice schedule due to that ACL tear. And at least based off of what Rothstein told us on the episode last week that, you know, talking to Isaiah Oliver, everything seems to be on track for him to be 100 percent week one. So I, I think uh, the reality of the situation um, is that, you know, Alford is going to be buried on the depth chart. Uh, but we'll we'll sort of see, you know, the other reason why I think that is you look at, uh, you know, the all important special teams in the preseason games, um, you know, it's um, Darren Hall and Mike Ford working with the quote unquote starters when it comes to those coverage units on special teams, while Alford uh, has been a backup now to Alfred's credit, he started out as like a third stringer 
on special teams against the Lions and then moved up the second team against the Jets. So one of the things we should keep an eye on this weekend against the Jaguars is whether or not Alford is quote unquote starting on those special teams units. And if he is, then we'll have to revisit this topic. And I'll basically say, forget everything I said on Friday. We might see um, D Alford um, on the active roster uh, on that 48 man active roster come week one. But my expectation uh, this year is that D Alford, despite having an incredible camp, earning a spot on the roster, um, you know, will probably wind up being inactive week one. We'll probably see D Alford at some point later this season, you know, injuries do occur and, and whatnot. And, you know, guys can play well or poor play poorly or whatever in their various roles. And the Falcons may want to mix things up uh, as far as that goes. So I think at some point we'll get to see D Alford on the field. And, and certainly I think we can sort of keep, that idea, that nugget buried in the back of our minds that, you know, maybe this could be a guy that we can develop long term to be, you know, maybe the, the groom behind Casey Hayward, who's, who's getting up there in age under a two year contract, Alford, you know, under a multi year contract coming from the CFL. You know, there's a chance maybe he could, you know, have a, a future as a starter here, but I don't think you should be expecting that right away again patience is going to be the key there with d alford over the next couple of years we'll see how he grows over the course of the season but uh you know we can uh probably pump the brakes a little bit on declaring him a potential starter for this team at least early in the season now later in the season we'll we'll have to sort of see but uh it's a kind of a similar conversation that we'll have coming up on today's episode uh talking about desmond ritter and how desmond ritter in this final practice of training camp outshine Marcus Mariota. And is this sort of the nail in the coffin for Marcus Mariota? And I say, not so fast. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit further about the timeline for when Desmond Ritter can be expected to start this year or what Marcus Mariota has to do to sort of keep the rookie uh, from nipping on his heels. Uh, but before we get there, guys, I do want to plug the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast where you can find three shows with four different hosts. It's A to Z with Mark Zeno. Hitting Hard with John Chuckery and ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanisha Batiste, all on the same podcast feed, talking local sports, talking national sports. Uh, and of course, Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube is uh, the place for the Locked On Braves postcast, breaking down every Braves win and loss this year. And it is also the place for the Locked On Falcons postcast, where Jarvis Davis and I will be breaking down every Falcons game live after, you know, well, Sunday, Saturday uh, against the Jaguars, probably around like 6, 630. You can see us live on Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube. Uh, and then, of course, throughout the regular season, you will probably see us, you know, 415-ish uh, most Sundays uh, this upcoming fall. So make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube uh, or wherever you get your podcasts. And guys, we've all been in situations where money can be a little tight and you're worrying about, you know, that next paycheck. You're worrying about those unexpected expenses. I know for me personally, I'm constantly worrying about my car just because it's an older make and model and, you know, those maintenance fees and you, you're worried about those things breaking down on you. And, uh, you know, these can create some stressful situations. But fortunately, my good friend Dave, uh, who is not a person, uh, Dave is a banking app can help me get out of those stressful situations. Uh, Dave, uh, the app can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. There's no interest. There's no credit check needed. Millions have already downloaded Dave and you can too. Just go to the app store and download Dave right now. That's D-A-V-E and sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly for terms and conditions. Go to dave.com slash legal instant transfer fees apply banking provided by evolve member fdic trust me your future you will thank you and guys i want to thank you once again for making lockdown falcons your first listen each and every day and make sure uh as part of your second listen you check out the ultimate pro football preview starting next week on august 31st it will be an eight episode extravaganza to get you ready for the upcoming 2022 nfl season and you'll have local experts like myself from all over the lockdown podcast network as well as odyssey nfl insiders combining for that ultimate nfl preview it starts again on august 31st all you got to do is search for ultimate pro football preview 2022 on the odyssey app youtube or wherever you get your podcasts so uh the other thing that sort of emerged on thursday's 
joint practices that Desmond Ritter had the better day of the two Falcons quarterbacks. Marcus Mariota threw two interceptions, although one of them was a drop uh, by Avery Williams, uh, where Chad Muma picked it off for you. Alua Kun uh, picked off his other pass, although uh, no word. It seems like that was just a good defensive play. Uh, but, you know, despite, you know, Desmond Ritter tearing it up in practice today, we're not going to read too much into it. Just like we haven't read too much into these joint practices, there's certain things that you can glean from them. But at the same time, I feel like going back and, you know, paying attention to what we were supposedly learning about this team from last year's joint practices against the Dolphins. You know, now I'm kind of pumped the brakes because I remember that first day of practice, uh, someone who covers the Dolphins told me that basically the Falcons kicked their butts. It was the worst day of practice the Dolphins had had, mostly due to the fact that the Falcons pass rush dominated the Dolphins offensive line. Now, that did signal to the Dolphins uh, that their offensive line was going to be a problem for them that upcoming season, but it did not signal to the Falcons that their pass rush was going to create problems uh, for opposing teams. So uh, that's why I sit here and I say pump the brakes on it. But you know, everybody's talking about when they talk about the Falcons, when people want to have me on the on their various podcasts, they want to talk about when is Desmond Ritter going to start? Why, why shouldn't the Falcons start Desmond Ritter? And, you know, I, I've already written down all you guys' names from two weeks ago that told me I'm the only person in the world that thinks Desmond Ritter has a chance to start. You know, I'm just an innovator and an icon when it comes to this stuff, which is always the case. You know, I say a thing and just give it a couple of weeks and everybody else is going to start saying the thing that I said. Uh, you know, no, and no, I'm not an egotistical man or anything like that but uh you know I, I sit here and i go like despite having the conversation about should ritter start or or you know should Mariota be the starter you know i i don't think you know as i've maintained since may that you know mary mariota should be the starter right you know and and the main reason i've explained that for is because you know we need marcus mariota to be that sort of sacrificial lamb for you know guys like behind me uh, and I'm pointing to the Aaron Donald poster. And apparently this guy is such a psychopath uh, that he at today's joint practice uh, between the Rams and the Bengals, he was using a Bengals player helmet as a bludgeon during a, a brawl or whatever. So channeling his inner Miles Garrett um, to, you know, destroy, you know, the the, the brains of a various Bengals players. So I don't want to throw Desmond Ritter <laughs> to that guy. Right. And I'll go back to the old metaphor I used uh, last week which was, you know, we're all running through the woods, right? It's it's me, you, um, Desmond Ritter, and, and Marcus Mariota. We're, we're being chased by wolves. And so me and you being serious Falcon fans and understanding what's going on with this team in terms of their long-term rebuild and what's in their best interest long-term, we look at each other, we give each other look, the nod, right, as we're running through the woods. And then that's the signal that you trip Marcus Mariota he gets uh, uh, consumed by the wolves and we usher uh, Desmond Ritter to safety. That's basically what we're doing these first couple of weeks um, for the season. But I know there's a lot of Mariota stands out there uh, that, you know, are upset that I'm not giving Marcus Mariota a chance by leaving him uh, to be sacrificed. It was like, hey, Mariota can can keep up and, you know, you guys can outrun the wolves. You don't have to trip him or, or whatever to continue the metaphor. But I, I do think Mariota should and has earned an opportunity to prove me wrong. Right. And I think that opportunity will come probably in the first seven or so games of the season, right? Because I think that's where you give Mariota that opportunity and you kind of wait. And then this has been the statement I've made since, you know, May when the schedule came out, um, that I think week eight is that prime spot for when you may be turning the keys over to Desmond Ritter. But those first seven weeks, I think Mariota has a, a great opportunity to prove me wrong. And I think if this team can get off to a, like a three and four start, then I think Mariota will have deserved and earned the chance to continue being the Falcon starter. I think two and five or less, and I think it's now time for the Falcons to sort of see what Desmond Ritter can bring to the table. And those numbers, those records come from basically playoff odds. Like if you go back to 1990, a two and five start means that you have about a 6% chance of making the playoffs. A three and four start means you have about a 19% chance. And so to me, two and five, like three and four gives you some glimmer of hope that, hey, you can do some things this year. Two and five is like, okay, like the odds are so stacked against you. It's not impossible, but it's it's so stacked against you that why not give the young guy uh, that golden opportunity, particularly during that stretch of the season uh, where you have in weeks eight and nine back-to-back -back home games against Carolina and the Chargers. Then you have a short week against the Panthers again in week 10, but you kind of want to give Ritter, if you're going to make that change, two full weeks of practice working with the ones in 
ahead of the week eight, week eight game uh, against the Panthers and the week nine game against the Chargers before you have to force him to have to get ready for a short week. Then you get, you know, a little bit of break, another home game against the Bears in week 11. Um, and so on. Then you go on the road against Washington, and then you think you're back at home against Pittsburgh, and then you have a bye week. So you get a lot more practice time during that window for Desmond Ritter because he's going to need it because basically once the season starts, he's going to not get really much of any practice time during the week once we get to September, once we get to next week or whatever. He's going to be basically having to take mental reps. So I, I think that's the prime window. Uh, and so you're basically seeing if Mariota can go out there and, and sort of blow up that window, break that window, so to speak, by getting this team off uh, to a good start. But, you know, it's also possible that if Mariota does not get off to the fastest start, maybe that window, you know, creeps up a little bit instead of waiting to week eight, maybe week six, again, another home game. I think you want to get Desmond Ritter. If you're going to start him uh, his first time, you want preferably it would be at home. Uh, week six game is against the 49ers. You don't really want to sandwich him on the road, get his first start in week five against the Bucs or week seven against the Bengals, two sort of Super Bowl uh, contending teams, or at least we believe to be the 49ers are technically, I, I think, also a Super Bowl contending team as well. So it's not ideal. But, you know, in that scenario, if the Falcons were to get off to like a one in four start um, this season, then I think you, maybe you would decide to, hey, why not give Ritter a shot against the 49ers in week six uh, and only, you know, proceed that sort of situation. But, you know, going back to Mario to having a chance, right? Um, and getting off to that three and four start or, or better, you know, I think it's going to really focus on that first month of the season where you really need this team to get off to a fast start because the three most winnable games in those first seven weeks come in the first four weeks against New Orleans in week one, Seattle in week three, and then Cleveland in week four. And so despite my negativity, um, I, I do think a three and one start is possible. I, I don't think it's likely, but I think it's possible for this Falcon team. I think obviously Seattle's shouldn't be a huge challenge. They're a team that's probably in the running to have the number one overall pick uh, this year. And, and one would hope that the Falcons can take care of business against them. Um, but, you know, New England, Cleveland, I think even though they're not sort of juggernauts um, at this point in time, I do think they do present challenges for this Falcon team, mostly because of how much better they seem to be in the trenches, right? We, we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking when we talk about Falcon Saints, we talk about Drew Brees and Sean Payton and, and, you know, Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara and Reggie Bush and all this various things. But ultimately the reason why the Saints have dominated this matchup against the Falcons for the better part of the last 15 years uh, in the Payton Brees era, again, not to discredit those guys for, making major contributions, but it's been primarily because the Saints have won the battle in the trenches. Like when the Falcons win the battle in the trenches, when they can get pressure on Drew Brees, when they can hold up against that pass rush, they have a chance to win. When they can't do those things, then they really have no chance of winning those games. So it's not a surprise there. And it's going to be tough against this year's Saints team, although their offensive line has major question marks. Uh, they still have one of the better defensive lines in the NFL. Pro, Pro Football Focus ranked them number eight overall in terms of defensive lines back in June ahead of this season. Uh, and then you have the Browns, um, who are a team that wants to run the football, have one of the best offensive lines of football. Defensive line isn't great. But, uh, you know, they do have two great players or one great player in Miles Garrett and one very good player in Jadavion Clowney on the edges. But they're kind of soft up the middle. So their defensive line, you know, if you can block those two edge guys, you can chip with the tight ends, do all that sort of stuff. You can maybe slow down that pass rush and, and pound the ball up the middle, although the Falcons interior offensive line isn't necessarily a strength at this point in time to deal with the Browns weakness. But the concern you have with the Browns is that offensive line pro football focus had them ranked number two uh, offensive line heading into the season back in June. Now they've dealt with some injuries at the center position, but I don't think it's going to suddenly tank their offensive line to be still not one of the better offensive line because the projected starters, Ethan Pochick, who has been, you know, a three or four year starter and been decent in Seattle these last couple of years. So they should be able to still be one of the better offensive lines. And so, the question you got to have if you're the Falcons, and again, I, I know you guys get mad at me when I say these things, but like how good does this defensive line, how good does this offensive line have to be in order to neutralize those strengths of those teams, right? Like, you know, if, if we're dealing with the Saints offensive or defensive line that's a top 10, top 15 unit, you know, do the Falcons need to have a top 10, top 15 offensive line in order to neutralize that, right? And then you look at PFF's rankings of the Falcons offensive line going into the season, they're 28th. So we're basically saying, OK, PFF has to be 10 to 15 spots too low on the Falcons offensive line. 
Okay. Uh, and then you look at the Browns defense or, or Browns offensive line. How good does the Falcons defensive line have to be to be able to neutralize that strength of the Browns uh, offense? Uh, you know, and pro football focus had the Falcons defensive line ranked dead last back in June. So again, are we sitting here saying PFF has to be 15 spots too low on the Falcons defensive line? So that's part of the reason why guys, despite, you know, Mariota having a chance, I'm not giving him as much possibility of being able to uplift this roster because I still think the major Achilles heel of this Falcons football team is in the trenches. And that's why like I term it as blowing smoke up your butt, you know, to basically sit here and pretend to you, Hey, you know, PFF has, has us ranked 15 spots too low in the trenches. And here's why the Falcons are, are going to be so much better because of Taquan Graham and Elijah Wilkinson and, Kayla McGarry, like, you know, I'm stuck on Kayla McGarry Island, guys, but you guys know I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you, hey, man, this is a five star hotel that it needs to be in order to deal with some of these things. So that's part of it, guys, where like, you know, I think, you know, Mario would get his chance. I think it's possible the Falcons can start the season three and one. Um, I don't think it's likely, but it's possible. And so to me, if this these offensive line and defensive lines are much better than people like PFF and myself are giving them credit for, then we got a chance to win these early games. Um, but if they're not, if they're, you know, a bottom five, bottom 10 unit, then I think, you know, it's going to be tough for us. And then at some point that's going to lead to us, you know, basically throwing Desmond Ritter to the wolves behind these questionable offensive line and without uh, sort of, you know, the horses up front on the defense to sort of keep, you know, some of these offenses at, at bay uh, later in the season, but we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, but um, you know, we'll see how it all plays out guys. Um, but we'll wrap up today's episode talking a little bit more about the offensive and defensive line uh, because we'll talk about sort of, whether or not the Falcons will be looking for more help at those positions during final cuts uh, next week. Um, but that will give us an opportunity to revisit uh, my 53-man roster projection but ahead of this final preseason game against the Jaguars uh, and sort of the biggest changes I would make to my roster projection that I made before camp uh, to today come on the offensive and defensive lines. So we'll, we'll talk about, you know, maybe, you know, the changes I have made will allow our offensive and defensive line rankings to, to jump 10 spots or something. Yeah. And so we'll get into that guys, as we continue uh, today's episode, but before we get there talking about this final preseason game, the Falcons are favored by four points. Um, I don't have a good feel for this game. I assume because I expect Ritter to play the bulk of the game and he's a better quarterback than whoever the Jaguars backup quarterback is, you know, Jake Luton. I don't know who it is. Um, I expect the Falcons to win the game, but you know, you know me, like whoever I think is going to win the game is probably going to wind up losing the game <laughs> when it comes to this stuff. So, uh, you know, if you want to take my advice or go against my advice, uh, head on over to the number one source for uh, odds, lines, and games. And that is, of course, betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way for all your sports betting needs, whether you're betting on preseason football, regular season football, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, uh, golf, even Vegas casino games. BetOnline is the place for you. They're the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, podcasts. They have it all. They have you covered. So head on over to BetOnline.net today. Use your mobile device to sign up as well. And BetOnline is where the game starts. So let's wrap up today's episode talking about the Falcons 53-man roster projection ahead of um, training camp. We'll obviously be talking about this early in the week when final cuts are made and certainly the reaction that we'll have off of Saturday's game uh, will sort of inform these decisions. But, you know, let's lay the groundwork a little bit. Again, let's continue uh, being an innovator and an icon here on today's episode. And if we're not going to go through the entire 53 man roster at this point in time, uh, we'll just go through the, the changes I would make. So if you want to see my initial 53 man roster projection, it should be on the card above, uh, linked above. Uh, but there was four changes that I would make to my roster if doing it today. Um, you know, at least ahead, and we'll see what if, if I have to make any additional changes 
uh, from Saturday's performance. Um, but my, that initial 53-man roster projection had 26 offensive players, 24 defensive players, uh, and of course three special teams. Um, but now I would, if I was doing it over, I would have an even 25-25 split between offense and defense. And the one offensive player I'm dropping is the fourth tight end, John Fitzpatrick. Uh, and you know I had Fitzpatrick making the team in addition to Kyle Pitts and Anthony Ferkser and Parker Hesse. Now I would drop him and take that offensive player off the roster and the defensive player I would add would be Quinton Bell. Um, you know, and I think there have been strong indicators that Quinton Bell has had a solid camp and will make this roster in part due to him working with the quote unquote starters on special teams in both preseason games, both on the punt team and the kickoff team. And the fact that he's been working with the second team unit on defense at that same linebacker spot ahead of D'Angelo Malone. He's been the guy playing across from Arnold Ebiketti in those games. And so, you know, I think that's a clear indicator that the Falcons like him a little bit more than D'Angelo Malone at this point, as far as defense goes. Um, and so, you know, it's also been Malone has been primarily a second teamer on special teams as well. So uh, I think that's a, a strong indicator that Quentin Bell uh, will be on the roster uh, come, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday and afterwards. Uh, the other change I would make is along the offensive line. Uh, we did talk about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago when it became clear that Elijah Wilkinson had sort of emerged as the Falcons, uh, you know, LG one. Uh, in terms of their starting left guard. And so uh, if I was making that change from earlier, Wilkinson would be in because I, I left him off my roster projection initially, and I would move Justin Schaefer, who I had making the team, off the roster to the practice squad. Now, I know some of you are saying, you know, you shouldn't be moving Schaefer off the roster. You should be moving Jalen Mayfield off the roster. And I get it, right? You know, but I don't think the Falcons are going to cut a second stringer a guy that's consistently been the second stringer to keep a third stringer. Now, if you're asking me what I would do, you know, I might do things differently, but it's not, you know, we're not talking about how I would build my roster Falcons roster. It's how I think they am predicting what they Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot and Ryan Pace uh, will do when they build their 53 man roster. So I do have both of those Georgia players not making the team in John Fitzpatrick and, and Justin Schaefer, but I do have them making the practice squad. Uh, so that's two of the four changes. The other two changes are come along the, the defensive line. I'm sorry. I had initially Vincent Taylor and Timmy Horn making it on my pre-camp roster projection. Taylor is obviously out for the season uh, with an Achilles tear. Uh, so he won't be making it, uh, but I will replace him with Nick Thurman. Um, and Timmy Horn, previously I referred to as essentially a placeholder as that six defensive lineman for a defensive lineman that I expect the Falcons to add next week after final cuts are made. Uh, and so essentially I'm now substituting that placeholder spot for instead of Timmy Horn being there, I think Abdullah Anderson will hold down that spot. So he's my final D lineman, uh, that six D lineman, but I do think there's a, a decent chance that the Falcons will want to replace him. And the reason why I went with Thurman and Anderson over Horn, who's had a, a pretty solid uh, camp and at least has played pretty well in the preseason games, is just because both Thurman and Anderson in these first two preseason games have both worked at nose tackle and defensive end uh, in the Falcons 3-4, uh, while Horn has been solely a 3-4 defensive end. And that gives the team a little bit more positional flexibility when it comes to their depth along the defensive line that you can plug and play Anderson and Thurman at any of the three uh, D-line spots rather than just one or or two. Uh, so I think that gives them a little bit of a, oomph, uh, a leg up when it comes to the competition there. But uh, I again, I still think that we'll probably see a D-line addition at some point, either Wednesday of next week or later uh, between the start of the regular season and once the Falcons scour the waiver wire, uh, and that will potentially push a guy like Anderson off the roster. But we'll see if that happens, and we'll run through the practice squad real quick. Running back, Quadri Olison, wide receiver, Frank Darby, wide receiver, Jared Bernhardt, wide receiver, Stanley Ber Ber Berryhill, uh, tight end, Michael Pruitt, tight end, John Fitzpatrick, offensive linemen, Ryan Newsel, Justin Schaefer, and Tyler Vrabel, a defensive lineman, Timmy Horn, and Derek Tangelo, although I, I do think that may be another outside entity that the Falcons bring into the building on the D-line over Tangelo. Uh, linebacker, Nate Landman, linebacker, Dorian Etheridge, cornerback, Matt Hankins, safety tease Tabor, and the 16th spot goes to a special teams player to be named later. Previously, I had Seth Vernon there, uh, but you know, since they cut him, I imagine the Falcons will bring in either a kicker or a punter uh, to carry on the practice squad and do the Elliot Fry thing of elevating him every other week uh, to the roster and then putting him back on the practice squad. So um, 
that's it, guys, in terms of the changes to my 53-man roster. Uh, we did not do the usual sort of wrap up the week with a preview of the upcoming game with Jarvis Davis. Um, this week, largely due to you know my expectations that there's not a whole lot to watch uh, in this game, or at least the two things I'll be focused on, that if we were going to do that, the two things I'll be focusing on, number one is guys stay healthy. Right. You know, I feel like mostly this roster is solidified that there aren't too many roster battles still up for grabs. It's just really about a couple of guys maintaining here and there um, to make sure that they solidify like Quentin Bell and Felipe Franks and Parker Hesse and, and those guys, rather than necessarily being too many roster battles up for grabs. The only real position battle that I think is worth paying attention to going into this final game is the center position. And my assumption is whoever starts this game against the Jaguars will be expected to be the Falcons week one starter at the center position. Uh, and so we'll just sort of see if that plays out or whatever that happens with that. But uh, uh, that's it, guys, in terms of the preseason preview. Uh, we'll be back uh, with Jarvis on Saturday evening uh, to talk about what happens in that preseason game. Um, and that will be on the Locked On Sports Atlanta YouTube channel. Uh, and if you missed the video version of that live after the game, you can check out the audio version of that here on the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel. We'll have Jarvis on the podcast at some point next week uh, to get his thoughts, deeper thoughts on the game, as well as you know the summer and what's to expect heading into the season. We'll have a little bit more conversation about how this team may construct their roster following on the heels of Saturday's game with Kevin Knight early next week as well ahead of those final cuts. And then, of course, we'll have you covered for those final cuts and any roster changes the Falcons make at that point in time and any, you know, bold, you know, depth chart changes that the Falcons have, you know, maybe, maybe Desmond Ritter starts week one. Maybe. Who knows? Doubtful. But, you know, who knows at this point in time? Maybe D. Alford uh, is the new nickel corner or whatever. And then, Notably, I did not have Deion Jones on my 53 man roster. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns on that, that at some point between now and September 11th, the Falcons will move on from Deion Jones. How they do it, I have no idea, but I, I will stick to that guns. I will die on that hill, and if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But uh, uh, that is the case uh, so far right now, guys. So that is it. I appreciate you guys for making Lockdown Falcons your first listen. Uh, and of course, always have recommendations for what your second listen should be, whether that's Locked On Sports Atlanta, Locked On Hawks, Locked On Braves, Locked On Bulldogs. Why not check out Locked On Fantasy? Um, and it's been Fantasy Draft Week all week long on Locked On Podcast Network. And check out Locked On Fantasy as your second listen, uh, where host Vinny Iyer is giving you over 20 years of NFL expertise and a unique angle to help you make all the right moves so that you can win your fantasy football season this year. So get ready for your fantasy draft with Locked On Fantasy football on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Guys, I appreciate it. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you enjoy the game. Hope everybody comes out of this game healthy. Uh, and stay safe out there for all of you guys out there as well. So really appreciate it till then.